Hello, um, welcome to Manchester, welcome to conference. My name is Steve Bloomfield, I'm the deputy editor of Prospect magazine. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to uh, 21st Century Housing Options, Landlord, the State or the Streets, uh, a panel debate about uh, the state of private housing, um, the state of the private rental market, and what that means for both the landlords and for tenants. Uh, we've got a wonderful panel here today. Uh, going from my <coughs> left, we've got uh, John Fuller um, from South Norfolk Council. Um, we've got uh, Chris Norris, Director of Policy and Practice at National Landlords Association. Uh, Dawn Foster, who's a political journalist who's written extensively about housing, uh, and Greg Beals, um, who is the campaign director of Shelter. There's quite a lot of uncertainty in the housing sector at the moment. Um, what does that uncertainty mean for the people you represent, for landlords? Sure. I mean, you're right to call it uncertainty. We, we really don't know what's happening, and that's beyond all the uncertainty and the chaos that we might be seeing here. Um, I think if you, if you look at private renting and the regulation that 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 sits within specifically. You know, our members tell us they can't plan. You know, they, they, most landlords in the UK, there's about two million of them out there, most landlords have only one or two properties, they're planning for their futures, they're planning for their retirements. Um, and at the moment, if you don't know what the, the tenancy law is going to be, you don't know if you're going to be able to get vacant possession on a property, you don't know what tax you're going to be paying month to month, or even when you go to dispose of that property, because we've seen changes to SDLT, to capital gains tax, to income tax. Um, they can't plan their futures, they can't plan their investments, they can't often plan their retirements, um, and they can't offer the range of households or homes that they've been asked to offer. So at the moment you've got an industry that you know, has money to invest, that wants to provide something, and doesn't feel able. Um, Greg Beals, is there not a case that there is a, um, an argument for reform at the moment when it comes to the, the private renting sector? Yeah, absolutely. So, good morning, everybody. So, I mean, I think that my argument to you this morning is that this, over the last sort of 20, 30 years, in fact, private renting has been a commercially very successful industry. It's grown very considerably. That growth, that, that commercial success, is changing the complexion of, of people who make up private renting. One in four children are now growing up, going to school from private rented homes. Uh, we're about to see, we're about to see an explosion in the number of over 65s who are renting privately is going to treble over the next uh, two decades. An increasing number of vulnerable people. Uh, most of the people my charity deals with who are struggling in the housing system are struggling with the private rented sector. And with that growth and those new, uh, the, and that changing complexion is going to become new responsibilities. Look, in, in, in housing, is providing people's homes, it is fundamental to the success of those children, to those elderly people, it's fundamental to the success of their life. And so with the growth in the sector is going to come new social responsibilities, which over time will mean new and different forms of uh, regulation to protect those people. And I think, I mean, I take what Chris says about um, some uncertainty, but I think if I was um, if I was a landlord in the industry now, I would assume that whatever the short run uncertainty is, the long term trend is towards more protection for tenants and greater regulation as the sector grows. And I'd be looking to places like Germany, which have much bigger sectors than even than England, and looking at the kinds of protections and regulations that are uh, in place there. John Foster, um, Chris talked about the uncertainty for landlords. There's uncertainty for tenants as well, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm a private renter, like most people who are uh, in the millennial generation. And I know a huge number of people who are too scared to ask their landlords to fix things. They will try and do it themselves because they're worried that if they ask their, their landlord to do anything, they will end up being evicted. And shelter work very hard to stop revenge evictions, um, but there is still a huge amount of uncertainty for tenants. Uh, the tenants still worry that anything they do could lead to eviction, and they're worried you know, extensively about rents rising and whether or not they will be able to afford that. Um, and also, Almost every person I know who rents feels completely <coughs> trapped in renting. Uh, their rent is so high they can't save, and because they can't save, they can't save for a property, and the properties are 
you know, far too expensive anyway. So a huge number of people feel that they are completely trapped in renting. If they want to have children, it's going to have to be in rented accommodation. And having children in rented accommodation is a very, very precarious position for them anyway. Um, so, you know, there are increasing numbers of protections that tenants are very happy about. Um, the fact that we no longer have to pay the uh, you know, fees when we rent um, is absolutely fantastic. I remember I moved into a flat in Brixton and we were looking at close to £700 in letting agents fees just to get into the flat in the first place. Um, luckily they've gone now. but. The uncertainty still remains. Uh, you still worry about whether or not your landlord will decide that they want to sell up, whether your landlord will decide they want to put the rent up massively. Um, and, you know, it, it still remains the fact that if you are a private renter, you are completely at the mercy of your landlord. Um, John Fuller, tell us about the role of councils when it comes to private housing now, because it's... Is there a role for for the local authority, and how is that changing? Well, of course, there's a role for the local authority. I mean, at the moment, I mean, I'm sitting at all for the LGA. Um, the um, there's almost a, we've almost tra fallen into this trap already. Like there's a binary housing market: you either own your house or you have a social house, and that's not the way the market works. The market works because the private rented sector has an important and large role in providing housing for those people who don't necessarily want to have uh, or can't have their own home to buy, but equally, for whatever reason, may not be able to you know, sign up to a very long-term uh, permanent uh, tenancy agreement with a registered social landlord. And I think sometimes this binary uh, approach to housing isn't doing anyone any favours. Uh, insofar as the council's concerned, private landlords are our friends. We could not possibly provide sufficient social houses uh, it, it, for the entire population, and we need to have a vibrant uh, sector in place. Uh, they help us um, house people in need, and in fact, um, sometimes the council, uh, in, in my own circumstance, uh, rents houses from private landlords and then in turn uh, uses them uh, for short-term rent. We certainly, in my own authority, which is in Norfolk, uh, have a deposit scheme, so if people can't uh, sweep together sufficient money for a deposit, and, and they would otherwise fall upon the council for, for, uh, for homelessness or whatever reason, we will help to get them into private rented accommodation. <laughs> We also have a role, um, a wider role, in terms of housing standards and enforcement and HRAs, as uh, HMOs rather. HR is a different thing. That's one of those three-letter acronyms. Uh, I know that, that the um, houses of multiple occupation, making sure there are decent homes. There's an enforcement role, and that's something I take very seriously in my own authority's area. Not least because uh, homes that are uh, where, where where private landlords abuse um, their, their tenants. Uh, over-occupation, for example, is, 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 is a precursor to trafficking. Uh, I mean, where, where do you think the people who run these hand car washers live? Now, these are, there's a smuggling operation as well. So we've got a strong um, enforcement role as well. I mean, there's loads of other things uh, we do, not least because the consequences of homelessness. We, we've, as a nationally, we've got 74,000 families in uh, bed and breakfast or temporary accommodation. You know, we're there uh, as the backstop. If you look around the world, typically the bigger private sector housing markets are the ones where there's more protection for tenants mm. and that makes them more enthusiastic to be in it, giving the market more customers. Uh, and I, I mean, that, that, that's a different way of thinking to how we think now about the private rented sector, which I appreciate often comes back to this choice. But actually imagine that, I mean, a country like Germany where people choose to rent privately, I think it's better than home ownership in Germany because the market is so appealing. And of course, that is, in the end, that's brilliant for the providers because they're operating in a huge market with much bigger revenues. And I think, and I appreciate there isn't a single reform that's going to move us to that sort of system, but I really think that's a, for me, that's a better approach to thinking about how we, how we manage and regulate this housing system. And I totally appreciate what John says about having to think about it as a, a system. Um, Chris, what are the, the regulations reforms that you would like to see, that you think you know, given what everyone's been saying about how you know, the growth in the private rental yeah. market, how it's changed, um, 
you know, perhaps it isn't unreasonable for there to be some changes, but then what regulatory changes should there be that you think would actually improve the way the system works? Because, you know, as we've been seeing, lots of people on both sides don't think it does work. No, absolutely. I mean, I, look, I, might, I might shock the room slightly by agreeing with Greg on a number of points here. Insofar as you know, we do recognise that the, the assured short haul tenancy, that what we have at the moment, is 30 years old and the private rent sector has moved on an enormous amount in 30 years. It houses a, a really wide spectrum of people. It, it was intended to get investment going, um, it did that in, with some other things, um, but really to, to be a, a niche, you know, to be maybe 10, 15 percent of, of the housing market. At the moment, we are pushing towards a quarter of all households. If you look at London, it's often 40% of the borough. Um, so there, there's, no, there's no point in suggesting that it can't be improved. Um, what I'm really desperate for us not to lose is the flexibility of the current system. You know, I think that the problems that we see quite often come about because we assume there has to be one, um, one, one fit for everybody, um, which isn't the case. You know, you're going to have people in you know, certainly in parts of the country where there's a transient workforce, where you need a lot of flexibility, there's a lot of contract work, where actually neither tenant nor landlord wants to put in place an indefinite tenancy. Equally, you've got lots of, uh, of family families living in, in households in the PRs where some more security works for everyone. To come back to, to Greg's point, you know, I don't see landlords and tenants being at odds about what they want. There are some nasty criminal landlords that we need to drive out of the sector who don't want to see long don't want to see their tenants staying in situ and being happy. But you know, across the, the widest proportion of the sector, if I've got a tenant who's happy, who's in a good quality home, my asset's being kept, kept um, in good condition, and I'm getting a regular income stream. So what's not to like? I don't want to churn people. Um, I would, however, caution against looking at Germany necessarily, only because the market's very, very different. You know, there are a lot of landlords, actually, that would love to see a German system because the moving standard is more like leasehold than it is like the private rented sector. Um, if you if you take a property, for instance, in, in Germany in the private rented sector, it's not uncommon at all for that tenant to contribute towards the new kitchen, the new bathroom, the carpets, the window coverings. If you did that in the UK, it would be a non-decent home. So you know we need to look at it in the round if we go there. Um, what I'd say to, to answer your question directly in terms of what we should what we should aspire towards for regulation, you know, I don't have an enormous problem in losing Section 21, in theory, if we can get the rest of the system to work. So if we can reform the court so that you can be guaranteed you will get a court date um, to have a hearing heard. If you have sufficient grounds that will take care of all of those issues that come up in a property. I mean, Greg mentioned earlier, against my, my example of antisocial behaviour, that you can use the system. Well, you can, but it's what's known as a discretionary ground. And it requires the judge to be convinced by other evidence. <coughs> very, very difficult to get people to go along in those circumstances to provide that evidence. So putting in place a system that allows for vacant possession when it's needed for a sale of a property, for genuine breakdowns in a tenancy, get that in place, get the sequencing right, get a system that works, and then you know, I'll, I'll happily see the end of no fault. Uh, but those things have got to come first. John, is part of the problem here that for at least the last 30 years, possibly, uh, arguably longer, we've been very much focused on home ownership. And that has driven um, pretty much every, not just government policy, but every political party's main policy has been about ownership, the sort of the move towards ownership. And we've sort of taken our eye off the, the rented sector. I don't, don't agree with that at all. Um, I mean, we believe here at the Conservative Party, we believe in, in choice and the market. And there are some people for whom buying their own home or a share in their own home is how they build a stake in society with, with strong family roots uh, because they can. But the state exists to let those people who can get on to do so. It gives a helping hand for those who can't. And I think the problem probably has been there's been an excessive focus in the last 10 years particularly on registered social landlords who... Uh, are delivering significant numbers of homes but have become almost quasi-developers in their own right and haven't necessarily done that community building, the, the role that no local councils uh, previously did. So I think there has been a, a distortion in the market, but the huge numbers, and I was 
uh, panel yesterday and Estimate Bay, uh, it was saying that £44 billion has gone into the registered social landlord sector since um, 2010. Uh, that doesn't seem to me to be an excessive focus on uh, uh, ownership alone. But I do feel if people want to build a stake in society, that one of the easiest ways is for them to, to, to own. But I know it's not for everybody. Um, Chris, John mentioned the um, Section 21, um, and this was a move by a Conservative government um, to, uh, to abolish no-fault evictions. Um, could you just firstly outline what Section 21 was, and then explain why it is that you think and that your members believe it's not necessarily the right move for you? Surely, I mean, firstly, Section 21 is still there. Mm -hmm. uh, Section 21 is Section 21 of, of the Housing Act 1988. Um, it's more properly referred to as no fault possession. So, if you've got a, if you're a private landlord, you've got a, a tenancy in place and a short short hold tenancy. Um, you've got two ways to bring that to an end, assuming that it's not an agreed surrender with your tenant. Um, you either cite a ground, a breach in the tenancy, someone owes rent arrears, or there's antisocial behaviour, or one of a number of other grounds there, and you go through the courts. Demonstrate to the court that that's happened and get a, an order for possession. Or if you've got a, a fixed term contract, you've got a, a 12, 24, 36 month contract, at the end of that, I can use Section 21, you know, fault, to say, okay, that tenancy has come to an end. In two months' time, I'd like you to vacate the, the property. And again, if the tenant refuses to do so, you still got to go to court, but you are pretty much guaranteed a possession order at the end of that. So it's still a completely legal court driven process. Um, but you've got that certainty that if I need an empty property for a reason, um, I'll get it. Now, we would say that you know, it, it's still there at the moment. We'd like to preserve it or something like it that gives us that, um, that certainty at the end of a tenancy um, on the basis that that's, that's how a landlord at the moment mitigates their risk of investment. So if I'm investing in you know, an asset, a very expensive asset, that, yes, is also somebody's home, and we can't forget that, um, I need to have... An exit mechanism. I need to have a way to liquidate that asset or to get a return on that investment if things go wrong or if my plans change. Um, now normally that will be because I need to sell a property. I can sell a property empty um, normally for more for more money, frankly, than mm -hmm. a property. But also if something's gone wrong that isn't really captured by the system. And I think this is this is the, the real issue for us right now. It's it's not that landlords don't it's not that landlords want to end a tenancy for no reason. It's that it's very, very difficult to demonstrate to a court what the reason is. So the, the example that we give a lot is antisocial behaviour. If you've got an HMO, the, the kind of properties, the shared properties that John mentioned, and you've got six people living in a house, one of them is very disruptive, the only way to end that tenancy on the basis of, of ASB, and antisocial behaviour, would be to get those other tenants who are being abused into court to give evidence against the tenant you want to evict. Now, with the best will in the world, with no certainty that that tenancy will be ended, um, it's very difficult to do that. Whereas if we can just allow a fixed term to lapse and then use Section 21, nobody needs to, no victim needs to be put up against their abuser um, to, to get them out of the property. So you know, it doesn't have to be Section 21, but it has to be a working system that allows a landlord to end a tenancy flexibly. Mm. I mean, the move to end Section 21 is not a... Yeah, this isn't a Jeremy Corbyn policy. This is, you know, to, just to quote Theresa May, millions of responsible tenants could still be uprooted by their landlord with little notice and little justification. This is a Conservative Prime Minister, yeah. or as was, who's saying, look, I've got concerns over this. Do you, do you see where she was coming from? We, we can't deny there are people out there that have used their position. You know, we've got something like 11 million people living in private rented housing in, in the UK. We've got two million people letting that, that property. There are going to be people there that are abusing that and they need to be enforced against and prosecuted and you know, appropriate protections need to be in place. The question I'd, I'd throw back, I suppose, against that, that kind of statement is, I'm a good landlord, I'm investing in property, I'm providing homes. I want people in those homes paying me rent, simply how the system works. Why would I end the tenancy for no reason? You know, we call it no fault, but there's always some reason there, some motivation to end that tenancy. Um, Greg, through the work you're doing with Shelter, do you? Uh, I'm guessing you come down on a on a different side to this. Yeah. Um, why? What? What? What yeah. do you? How do you see things in the way that, that you think Chris doesn't? 
Yeah, so I mean, I think it's worth saying, I think from our perspective, this is one of the most uh, important reforms that this government, the Conservative Party, could pursue. And I think the fact that the government's committed to it, from our perspective anyway, shows that they do understand the dynamics that are at play in solving this housing emergency that we've got. Um, I think it's quite telling, I mean, I think it's quite telling that the example Chris uses of these eviction for no reason being used is actually an example where there clearly is a reason, antisocial behaviour, and it would be very possible to pursue that through what's called a Section 8 eviction. I think, I think, I mean, Chris's point is, well, it's easier to pursue that through Section 21. I think it probably is. Um, but I, just to be clear, in order to make it easier for the landlord to pursue that eviction through Section 21 when they could pursue it through Section 8 and evict that, those five people sharing a home because of antisocial behaviour, we're giving landlords the power to evict children who then have to move school, they may have to change their, um, uh, may have to change their doctors, may have to change all the public services that go around that, be uprooted. And we're giving landlords the power to evict 70, 75-year-olds. We've come across examples of elderly people being evicted using Section 21 on the basis that the landlord doesn't want to pay for the home adaptions that are necessary for that person staying in the home. Now, we can all understand why a landlord might not want to pay for home adaptions, walk-in bath and so on, as that person reaches their latter years. But it seems to us incredibly important that we have a regulation and legislative framework that, yes, allows the uh, people committing antisocial behaviour to be evicted uh, through the process of a Section 8 eviction. The court can consider it if they, if they want to contest it and they can be evicted, but protects children, the elderly, the vulnerable, who are relying on this private rented homes uh, and who at the moment are at the whim of a system uh, that gives them no protection and no right of recourse uh, in law. Dawn, is there a way that um, in the reforms that are being talked about at the moment, the debate that's taking place at the moment, that, uh, that there are compromises that can be reached between uh, people on the side of tenants and people on the side of landlords. Are there, is there middle ground that, that we're sort of missing in this debate? Um, yeah, I think there can easily be a middle ground. I think that um, is very, I think that it's quite straightforward to evict problem tenants, people who aren't paying their rent, people who are, you know, uh, destroying the house, etc. Um, but at the moment, tenants feel completely at the whim of their landlord. So at the moment, it feels as if the rights are solely on the on side of the landlord. Uh, there have been one or two um, changes that help tenants a little bit, but still, at the end of the day, if your landlord decides to put the rent up uh, and you can't afford it, you are then out. Uh, there isn't any way around that. So I think that rent controls could be um, a really good idea, and I think that... Um, bringing them in with certain regulations uh, would be a very, very good middle ground. Uh, they happen in Germany, they have, you know, Germany have, as Greg says, um, a lot of tenants' rights that uh, seem to work very well for landlords as well. So I think that bringing in those sorts of things could be very, very helpful, um, because at the moment it feels as if tenants are completely at the whim of their landlords, and uh, even though there have been um, some things, such as letting fees being abolished, um, you know, certain certain movements around evictions, it does still feel as though the power is almost entirely with the landlord. So as a tenant, you worry constantly about whether or not your landlord will decide to get you out, and they can easily do so by hiking up the rent or going through the courts. Um, John, from a, I can ask you from a... Conservative Party point of view, um, where do you, how do you feel about these uh, these changes that the the government or the previous government was, was trying to bring in? Do you, because they're they're not policies that necessarily um, resonate. <laughs> perhaps don't possibly resonate with your party. I mean, it's interesting because we've got the landlords and the speakers who are very much focused on the tenant side. 
the, the job of the state is to try and manage a housing market. And, 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 and so I think it, it's really, and, and councils in particular, have the job to manage housing markets locally. That's our role. So when, when you're searching for the middle ground, you know, I am the person who is trying to hold that middle ground in my, in my area. And that means working positively with landlords, because you know, a landlord who decides to evict a family for whatever reason you know, potentially creates a case of homelessness. And we pick up the pieces, as I said earlier, there are 74,000 people currently today sitting in temporary accommodation. And that's not in our interest. So actually there's a fiscal incentive for councils to positively engage with landlords to try and fix problems. And, and, and we've got a series of schemes. Um, you know, and, and, part, and part of our remit and role isn't just to stand, stand off, recognising that the long stop position, the, the consequences of an eviction are potentially a very expensive homeless situation, we are positively incentivised to try and sort out people's debt problems. So we're, in, we're interceding um, uh, in, in some situations to, to either reschedule debts because the rent, some, it can be the last thing to be paid if there's other more pressing uh, debt situations. So it does need a holistic preventative uh, uh, approach. So, you know, we, and, but equally, the landlords are providing that supply. We need to give at least an opportunity for them to make a reasonable return in a responsible basis, but also recognise, ultimately, many private landlords are there for um, uh, to retirement. And the point at which they retire or their family circumstances change, perhaps they've got to pay for a son and daughter to get to university, who knows? Uh, I think managing local housing markets as we do, we've got to be respectful that that's a realistic and genuine situation. It's, a, it's part of someone's life story. It's why that landlord, private landlord, got into um, renting in the first place for a nest egg. And I, so to answer your question, it sits somewhat uncomfortably with me that um, just because someone gets into this game in the first place, that is from the landlord's perspective, all of a sudden they're handcuffed. And I think that the system has to recognise there are some life events, not just in the tenants, uh, lives, but also in the landlord's eyes, uh, that, that w would allow a termination of a tenancy to come to respect those points. Otherwise, the overarching responsibility is we can have a reduction in supply, and that doesn't help anybody. Uh, and I think that, that that's the balance. So that's what I try and do, managing my local housing market with rental guarantees and all those other uh, techniques. And it's a balance, and it isn't binary. It's not just the tenants. It's not just the landlords. Our job is to hold the ring in the middle.